This is Trump on Earth. I'm Reed Frazier. The miners told me about the attacks on their jobs and their livelihoods. They told me about the efforts to shut down their mines. I made them this promise. We will put our miners back to work. President Trump came into office promising to save coal and coal jobs. Instead, America's coal industry has continued to slide. The question now is, how far will it go? An industry that once employed hundreds of thousands now has about 50,000 workers left, and eight coal companies have declared bankruptcies in the last year. The latest is Murray Energy, the biggest privately held coal mining company in the country. We wanted to check in on the state of the coal industry in the Trump era, so we're talking with someone who knows a lot about it. Taylor Kirkendall covers the coal industry for S&P Global Market Intelligence, and he joins me now to talk about it. Taylor, welcome. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. Okay, so let's talk big picture. Not long ago, 2001, about half of our electricity came from coal. That's really, now we're talking about half of that amount as we sit here today. And we have uh, lots of bankruptcies happening. Uh, What has happened in the Trump era, if we can call it that, to uh, the coal industry? Right. So I think um, one of the the big picture or takeaways here is that it's been largely the same um, what's happened under the the Trump administration for the coal industry. They've obviously gotten some relief from uh, rules and regulation, but for the most part, the trajectory remains the same. Um, coal plant retirements in, in the first year of the Trump presidency were actually um, accelerated compared to the year prior. And uh, we've continued to see more announcements. And, and I think that for most outlooks um, going going forward, um, people will tell you that they're expecting the um, the exact same to continue, uh, perhaps at a slower race, rate as we go forward. Um, and that's just because uh, a lot of the, um, the easier to retire plants have been done. But um, also one of the reasons that we just don't see that many retirements on the um, on the planning board just yet is simply because, um, you know, sometimes those announcements come out and, and they retire pretty soon. So I wouldn't be surprised if we um, kind of stay roughly the same pace, maybe a little slower than what we've seen in the last couple of years. I want to talk about Murray Energy. Uh, they were the big news recently. Maybe you can just explain what Murray Energy is. Sure. So Murray Energy is the, the largest privately held um, coal company in the U.S., um, they had recently um, been doing a lot of expansion efforts, um, and that was something that wasn't happening a lot in the industry. When others were filing for bankruptcy, they were uh, scooping up assets. Um, they were mostly a thermal coal producer. They, that means they mostly were focused in on, on mining the kind of coal that's used to produce power in the United States. Um, the other type of coal, our other main type of coal being uh, metallurgical coal used in steel making. Um, Murray had recently um, bought a few mines in that space, but still predominantly a, a thermal coal player. Um, in addition, um, the CEO was also very heavily political act- or politically active and um, was one of the big names kind of behind, if you think of the, the coal lobby and, the, and what the coal industry is trying to get done politically. Bob Murray was kind of, you know, the top of the, the, uh, the food chain there. So why did Murray Energy have to file for bankruptcy? Right. So they faced a lot of the same pressures that the rest of the coal industry had faced. Um, natural gas is competing with their market. Um, recently, um, you know, when, when Trump first took office, there was a kind of a, a boom in exports um, in the U.S. Um, for coal, and that helped a lot of people kind of offset this decline in domestic demand. Unfortunately for the coal producers, the export demand went away, um, and so a lot of coal companies that um, you know were kind of floating on that saw that that market go away. And when they came back and tried to put that coal in domestic markets, they found that it either wasn't there or their competitors had already signed contracts locally. Um, and so in addition to all those market factors, though, um, all these acquisitions and growth that Bob Murray was was um, kind of active in also put a lot of debt on the company's balance sheet. I mean, we're looking at um, potential actual legacy liabilities, which he picked up in, um, largely through those acquisitions of about $8 billion dollars. Um, some outstanding, you know, funded debt obligations of 2.7 billion. Um, well, they had an annual. All that debt came with an expense, right? They're paying about 298 million um, in, in interest and, and other debt fees, and they're only earning about, you know, 542 million um, EBITDA, um, which is just basically earnings, you know, after taxes and, and other expenses. So, as you can imagine, if um, that much of your money is being sunk just to keeping your debt alive, and you're only earning, you know, less than twi- uh, twice that. Um, the, the company was in a real pinch um, financially, 
And ultimately, their um, their lenders didn't want to keep giving them passes on not paying. We're finding out now that you know they weren't honoring some of their commitments, um, and it had always just kind of uh, too much to bear. And ultimately, the company. Uh, decided if they're going to go forward and continue to producing, they're going to have to get rid of some of this debt first. So that $298 million a year, that was basically like spending half your paycheck on your visa bill or your MasterCard bill or something like that. Right. And what was being added to your, you know, your balance. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, for like the consumer. It's kind of about the, cl- the closest you can get to the thinking about that from a company perspective. So I want to talk about Bob Murray as a political animal. It invigorated us. I've fought this fight every day. And now I'm going to bury the sons of bitches. He was a big supporter of President Trump. I called Donald Trump's office at Trump Tower in New York. And when I walked into his office, and he was alone, we talked for 50 minutes. I can talk, he can talk about coal, about the connection between coal miners' jobs, coal miners' families. I I was so impressed with him. And he had this sort of wish list that he presented to Trump early in his presidency, or at least to Trump, uh, you know, cabinet officials. What was on that list? And did any of it get accomplished under Trump? Yeah, so this is a, it's a long list and um, kind of mixed results. I'm always asking for it. You know, one of the things he wanted was um, to invoke kind of some emergency rules under the Federal Power Act that would have um, basically said that, you know, we needed this electricity um, for national security or for other purposes. But um, ultimately, the DOE wasn't able to push that through. Um, basically, it was, this was uh, Murray was trying to protect some power plants that were, that were set to close. You know, he tried to get at the heart of the the Clean Air Act's um, carbon dioxide um, endangerment findings went after um, several different things with the Clean Power Plan. He, they did um, um, were able to, to nix the um, Obama administration's stream protection rule, um, which basically set rules about how close your your coal plants can be um, near streams. Um, he was looking for reduction in taxes, which um, we saw that happen at a state level in West Virginia. Um, one of the the big Things that he wanted to do was invest in in clean coal technologies. And when M- Murray talks about clean coal technologies, he's not um, talking about carbon free coal technologies. He mostly means higher efficiency plants. Um, that's something the DOE has rolled out a lot of opportunity and money for. We've also heard some kind of more generic things, like point some more justice to the Supreme Court. Obviously, that has happened. Um, and then he also wanted to eliminate the the overtime rule. Um, basically, just um, it was things that were going to be designed to make it to make it easier to burn coal and also easier to mine coal. Where this was successful, it hasn't really proven to move the needle much on as far as coal's kind of long term or even medium term prospects. Right. So the Trump administration has rolled back a lot of these rules. He's kind of given uh, the coal industry almost everything it could have asked for. Um, it didn't declare an emergency on the grid, which would have uh, forced rate payers, particularly in my part of the country, maybe yours too, uh, the mid-Atlantic region, to pay more for electricity from coal. Um, that was a big ask in the beginning of the administration. But it recently rolled back the coal ash rule and something called the Effluent Limitations Guideline, basically water pollution from, from coal-fired power plants. It sort of eased regulations on those two uh, big Obama-era regulations on, that, would, that you know, the coal industry did not want to see go through. Um, so I want to ask you about another... <laughs> Uh, another rule that the Trump administration is trying to roll back, and that's the MATS rule. That can you explain just basic outline of what that is? That's the mercury and air toxics standards. The Obama administration, you know, sort of advanced this rule, and then coal-fired power plants had to comply with the rule. Many did. Uh, what's happened with that rule, and and what is the sort of point of rolling back a regulation that? a lot of coal-fired power plants have already complied with. Right. I mean, that's an, it's actually an excellent question. Why, why roll back a rule that they've already um, complied with? And I think a lot of the utilities um, had the same question in mind. 
one of the problems you have there is that that, that creates a lot of uncertainty for those players that, that have already made big investments to comply with that rule. It's you know it's tough to say why they do it. I know that there is kind of some um, you might have some ideological arguments to say that like if you thought that that was an overstep of EPA's authority, um, that the rule should be repealed to prevent um, maybe precedent set in the future. But I mean I think you kind of uh, hit on the main point here, and I think at least from the, the financial um, perspective that, that we're watching, um, most utilities have decided that that was um, inv- those investments were put in place. Um, they got extensions on they, where they could on on complying with that. Um, and so it took a few years, but I mean, largely it just took so long to do anything about that rule that I think that the damage was done. Um, essentially, most utilities have those mercury um, controls installed on their plants now, and I would think that they're probably likely to run them. Um, you know, you don't want to sink that much capital investment in the not. And then obviously there's also like the concern of like, will a future administration just turn that rule around again? But um, yeah, I think ultimately when, when we talk about did regulations um, impact the coal sector, um, the clean power plan probably didn't have much influence um, beyond what natural gas was going to do anyway. Um, the mercury and air toxic standard was definitely a rule that led to a lot of utilities making decisions to close plants earlier than they would have without that rule. But that's largely in the past, and I don't think there's much the Trump administration can do about that at this point. So tell me a little bit about Bob Murray. He sounds like a larger-than-life figure. My colleague Jeff Brady recently interviewed him. The government should be stepping in and keeping coal fire generation in existence, and the government's done nothing. And uh, just as a note, Bob Murray is on an oxygen machine, and that's my, so there's a hissing sound in the background of his voice. Not only am I fighting for my own life, but I'm fighting for the life of my employees, my company. My goal is to keep the company together. Keep it together for my employees. What can you tell me about Bob Murray, who he is, um, and maybe uh, what his sort of legacy is for the coal industry in specifically in the U.S.? Yeah, so Bob Murray, um, he founded Murray Energy, I believe it was back in the, the late 80s. The mythology around Bob Murray is he, he mortgaged everything he owned. Um, he bought a single mine, um, the Powhatan Number no. 6, um, that um, was getting ready to close. Um, he managed to keep it open. Since then, he made a number of acquisitions. Those were all kind of um, just him Getting started, I guess, is a is what will later be a big coal empire. Kind of the most attention kind of centered on him in around 2013. Uh, that's when he um, bought up these huge long wall coal mining operations uh, from Consol Energy and started to really kind of expand um, the size of his thermal coal operations. Looking back now, there, you can see where that that's actually caused a lot of his problems. When he bought those mines, he took on 2.4 billion dollars in in liabilities at the same time, but. That was at a time when a lot of the industry was trying to get away from coal, um, and also when Bob Murray was becoming more vocal about how essential coal was going to be to, to you know keep the grid running. He ended up forming a new uh, coal export company, Javelin, um, bought um, Armstrong Energy, um, took over some of their thermal coal mines in the Illinois Basin. And then um, he recently also um, kind of dipped his toe into metallurgical coal markets um, by buying some, some mines from from uh, Mission Coal, which is actually as recently as earlier this year, um, which might surprise some given the... the the bankruptcy just happening. I think that's probably part of the challenge now is, you know, here's this guy that was was committed to being what he described as the last man standing in the coal industry. Um, while everybody else was going to fade away, he was going to secure himself this chunk of a, of a declining market. And by having, you know, really low cost coal mines that are really close to the power plants, he'd be able to survive when nobody else could. And I think that probably more than most of the other bankruptcies, Murray Energy kind of really represents like a shift and. You know, if he can't make it, you know, who can? I'm guessing that Bob Murray was not really all that worried about climate change and and some of the broader big picture environmental problems with burning coal. No, no, this was definitely something that that he wasn't concerned about. He told PBS a couple years ago, we do not have a climate change problem. And here's that clip. We don't have a climate change problem. It is not real and not scientifically based. It's a theology, it's politics, and it's an agenda. Uh, In some ways, I think a lot of people 
um, have looked back at the industry and said, hey, if you would have invested in carbon capture you know, a couple decades ago, you might be sitting in a lot better position now. Um, coal wouldn't be emitting carbon dioxide and people would be less worried about it. Um, to some degree, that might be true. I mean, of course, the problem with that was it was, was going to make coal plants even more expensive. And, and right now, it's not carbon dioxide regulations that are, that are killing coal. Again, it's natural gas. But yeah, um, Bob Murray kind of like, you know, sat on the other side of the, the climate change debate. They packed the U.S. EPA with radical environmentalists, never created a job in their lives, never produced anything for society, but sat there writing rules all day. I have nothing but contempt. But you mentioned he's, and this is an industry-wide problem, there are these legacy costs in terms of paying for pensions, paying for health care for workers. Apparently, Murray Energy was the last company paying into the UMWA, the United Mine Workers Association, pension benefits. Can you uh, fill that out for me? Yeah, sure. So um, basically, you know, we, we had a couple big bankruptcies. Um, the, the union has been getting a lot smaller um, in the coal sector lately anyway. But then um, with Patriot Coal's bankruptcy, that was a major uh, part of the union nice workforce. And then when um, Bob Murray kind of became the biggest player um, with uh, a union workforce, when he, when he bought those mines from Consol Energy, that's where most of his uh, unionized workforce came from and where he picked up those extra liabilities. Um, I looked at bankruptcy filings recently um, that he filed. He had some presentations that he was shopping out to potential financiers um, to get him through the bankruptcy. And when you total up uh, post-employment benefits, uh, workers' compensation, uh, what he owed uh, for you know black lung expenses, uh, pensions, and, and kind of all that that basket of what you owe, um, you know, obligations to your employees, uh, the total of that was five point eight three billion. And again, going back to this idea that you know they were earning just a little over half a billion a year, um, that's a lot of money to be um, you know, to have on your on your balance sheet. Just a day after elect the election. Um, Senator McConnell and Senator Manchin and Capito, uh, the two representatives from West Virginia, introduced a, a bill to pay for miners' pensions. What can you tell me about that? And is that related to somehow the results in uh, the Kentucky gubernatorial race or something? Or what are we to read into the timing of that bill's introduction? Yeah, it's really it's really tough to kind of speculate on that. And I haven't seen the full um, copy of the bill yet. The general idea, though, is to take a bunch of um, excess money um, from uh, from abandoned mine land funds and and move that over to to shore up the those those pensions. Um, a couple thoughts on the timing. I mean, Murray Energy and Bob Murray specifically has to be looking at that legislation and wondering why it couldn't have come earlier. Um, that's the kind of thing that might have. Um, staved off their bankruptcy as well as the, maybe the bankruptcy of some other companies because those are just um, huge liabilities. Um, but yeah, I, I think that you know, the elections in Kentucky may have something to do with that. Um, definitely, I know a lot of people have been calling on McConnell to take some action um, for these coal workers. And um, while I don't think it's changed everybody's mind, I know that it, even some coal miners have um, started to wonder why you know a guy that's that's been so supportive of the industry in the past hasn't hadn't stepped up to do anything there. Right. I mean, the it wasn't just like Wednesday that that uh, people have asked uh, McConnell to to step in and put this legislation through the Senate. Right. It's. I mean, it's definitely really strange um, for it to come in just you know days after after Murray's bankruptcy. And, and you're right that the you know elections in Kentucky. Um, coincide with that as well. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of kind of weirdness about the timing there, but really tough to, to figure out exactly why I might do that. And, and you know, really the long-term prospects of the bill, you would think that with the Senate majority leader on board, um, that it should have a lot easier time passing. But, you know, we still kind of wait and see on that because it's not really clear why there hadn't been enough support for it before as well. And I should just back up and clarify that Republican Governor Matt Bevin lost narrowly to Democratic challenger Andy Bashir in the Kentucky gubernatorial race. Um, so we have an array of environmental rollbacks that have been put through under the current administration, or ha at least have been, you know, set in motion. You know, who knows what will happen in 2020, uh, who will be president and in charge of the EPA then. But I mean, 
What do you see as sort of the near-term future of the coal industry? Has it sort of hit the bottom and it's going to stay at this plateau, or is it just a steady trajectory to uh, become less and less important to the American you know, electric grid? Yeah, so there's a lot of different paths that go forward, especially when we start talking about administration changes. I, I think if we start from a base case, um, the coal industry is going to continue to decline. Um, here's the problem. The the We've seen a lot of coal plant retirements already. Um, those aren't going to come back, um, you know, more than likely. Um, and nobody's really building any new coal plants um, as a kind of a general rule. So what, what, what happened, all your customers are gone and you're not getting any new customers. Um, the existing customers, um, when I say customers, I mean power plants, are getting older and um, less efficient generally, um, or they require more investment to become more efficient. And meanwhile, there's tons of cheap options right now. Natural gas um, is very cheap. Renewable energy is increasingly um, creeping more into that space. Um, If you were to have somebody come in, for example, and say ban fracking, natural gas prices would shoot up. Um, That would probably help coal kind of hold steady. I think it's pretty safe to assume that really no matter who um, comes in, the coal is going to continue to decline. It will just be a matter of um, of speed. I, I was just at a coal conference, and kind of the consensus there was that you know people think that the coal industry has more bankruptcies coming, and whether that's Trump or not, um, they see more um, high impact bankruptcies. This was a metallurgical coal focused conference, um, you know, used for uh, the coal used for steel making. And I think for a long time, at least in the very foreseeable future, um, we're going to have demand for coal um, from other countries. Um, obviously, a, a Democratic uh, candidate could come in and, you know, say we're going to ban, you know, coal exports. We're not going to send other countries or something like that. And that might change things. But I, I think even people in the coal industry would like to see maybe some of these other coal producers shut down their minds. It's just a matter of who that's going to be and how long it's going to be um, taken to catch up to that. That's something um, I've been hearing other coal producers talk about wanting and needing to see happen to, to correct the market size for, I mean, years now. Why do they want their competitors to close? Well, yeah. So the, whenever you, um, when, when you're obviously when your competitors close, that gives you a lot more opportunities for customers. But one of the problems that we've seen so far is that these bankruptcies um, don't really tend to have any kind of meaningful impact on the level of production. But when you file for bankruptcy and you keep running your mines, um, you you now are able to kind of sell your or your coal either at the same cost and, and make more money or at a lower cost um, and still make the amount of money you're making before. Um, well, your competitors that didn't file for bankruptcy can't do that. Um, and when we had all these bankruptcies close, a lot of these coal companies, what they've done in the meantime is not really um, invest in their coal mines. Um, and that means that you know their, their mines are going to keep getting more and more expensive, less efficient, because they haven't put a lot of capital into it since the bankruptcies. A lot of these bigger coal companies have actually been favoring kind of shareholder uh, buyback returns and things like that, basically funneling cash down to the the investors. Um, so if you could get rid of some of that comp- competition, um, it would help some others a lot and kind of give them some some more margin relief. That doesn't mean that they're going to start making more coal. It just means that maybe they could finally charge a price um, to the point where their, their margins aren't so narrow that they're they're staring down bankruptcy every couple of months. Back in 2016, Trump made a lot of hay with something that Hillary Clinton said. I'm the only candidate which has a policy about how to bring economic opportunity using clean renewable energy as the key into coal country. Because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. I went to a group of miners in West Virginia and I said, How about this? Why don't we get together, we'll go to another place, and you'll get another job. You won't mine anymore. Do you like that idea? They said, no, we don't like that idea. We love to mine. That's what we want to do. I said, if that's what you want to do, that's what you're going to do. Do you see uh, Trump being able to, you know, use some sort of Um, war on coal framing in this upcoming election, or has that ship kind of sailed? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be tough. We um, talked to to Bob Murray um, back in 2016, and he was saying Trump can't bring the coal industry back to where it was, but he'll slow things down. Trump himself said he was going to bring back coal um, in several several different ways and in different venues. But um, I think it's ultimately going to come down. I mean, is the 
is the average voter going to go out there and, and check what that track record was in terms of um, bringing back the coal industry? I think if you look at the numbers, um, he clearly did not bring back the coal industry. Um, you could argue whether that could have been ex- like that, that decline would have been accelerated um, under another president, and, and probably probably so. I mean, if we would have seen Hillary Clinton elected as president, there's a good chance that we would have saw more stringent regulations put on the on the coal sector. But yeah, I, I think that. We even heard this before the Trump election when I talked to people that are that are in the mining industry, that that war on coal language was kind of divisive and not really effective. Um, it was it was a great kind of rallying cry if you already like felt like your industry was under attack by the government and that you needed help, but it wasn't really something that that picked you up a lot of a lot of friends, um, you know, outside of that that community. I think it'll be interesting to see how how Trump does kind of play coal. Um, going forward, and and whether he will um, continue to kind of cater to the to the voter that wants to hear the message that, that the coal industry is coming back, or that that something can be done, I, I definitely don't get me wrong. Have seen miners say that they think that he slowed things down, and that it could have been worse, and this is just kind of the best you could hope for. Um, and you hear a lot of people talk about you know, but hey, now the free market's working, and I can handle natural gas um, beating me, but I, I didn't want the government to be doing it. That sounds like that to me, like kind of, I think probably comes off of something that companies and, 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 and those that are kind of running the businesses might think, but it's hard to imagine a, a coal miner like getting much comfort from that whenever, you know, they start thinking about, you know, did Trump help the industry or not? Yeah, I, uh, I, I often wondered, though, if, you know, there's a sort of signaling that that Trump was doing. Um, that goes far beyond the 50,000 people who work in coal mines, but just these are the kinds of people that I'm behind and my opponent is not, Um, uh, you know. And you could take that in lots of different ways. You could say these are rural people, these are white working class people, these are um, people who work in extractive industries, um, whatever. That that it was almost like a, a culture war kind of, uh, you know, this war on coal stuff wasn't just about like the economy or the environment, but it sort of fit into the culture war we've all been sort of living through in the last, you know, couple decades in America. I started um, doing a lot of the energy reporting um, based in Charlottesville, Virginia now, but started in West Virginia. And um, I definitely get that. I mean, the coal and the culture around it um, in that region is, is, um, it goes beyond just it being a job, and I think that um, a lot of people in similar similar industries can probably identify um, with those guys, and, and more so than other industries. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that I think it's it's fair to say that, that Trump has always been kind of good at is um, uh, painting a picture or making an image that's kind of easy to understand, and I don't know that you could think of a, a better stand-in for kind of blue-collar worker than a coal miner. Um, so there is something to be said that, yeah, like the, the message isn't just for coal miners when he's talking about, you know, the war on coal and, and changing regulations. Um, it is probably a, a message that's a little bit more appealing to, to people elsewhere as well. Well, Taylor, thanks so much for talking with us about this. Hey, thank you very much. Um, always happy to, to chat about coal. And uh, you are part of a new podcast. Tell us what what's that podcast called and where can we find it? Uh, yeah, so we're um, Energy Evolution. Um, it's a podcast here at s and Global. I'm doing that with my colleagues, Allison Good, who uh, specializes in oil um, and natural gas, and my colleague, Dan Testa, who uh, specializes in power. Basically, what we're talking about is uh, the future of energy, um, how fast everything's changing. Um, we're really taking kind of approach from the from the business end. So we're talking to a lot of um, key government officials, uh, business leaders, and anybody else really out there that has some like really good ideas about the, the future of energy. All right. Well, we'll check it out. Taylor Kirkendall covers the coal industry for S and P Global Market Intelligence. You can follow him on Twitter, and believe me, you want to do this. It's at T A Y K U. Why? At Taikui or something like that. <laughs> um, okay. Well, thanks so much, Taylor. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Trump on Earth. If you like our show, please consider supporting us through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Trump on Earth. You can find us online at trumponearth.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. And while you're at it, I don't know, rate and review can't hurt, right? 
This podcast is supported by the Robert F. Schumann Foundation. Our producer and digital editor is Andy Kubis. Kathy Nauer is the executive producer. I'm Reed Frazier. See you next time.